Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special two-episode week of Second Act. Actors, I hope you're coming to this episode after just listening to Stacy's episode, because this is Doug's episode. So like I said in the episode before, two-episode week, these two individuals are so different from each other. They're so unique with incredibly different stories, and they happen to be married to each other. I love it. So both of them, Stacy and Doug, went to theater school, decided not to pursue acting, then had a second act career, and are now in a different third act career. And again, like I was saying before, have this wonderful way of being able to blend creativity from all their different acts into now this lovely third act life that they have created together. So this episode is Doug's episode. So Doug Ironside and I met through Stacy. She uh, kind of forced us together saying, I think Janet would be a really good, you know, member of your improv group. And I said, dear God, God, improv is scary. But Doug said, no, you're going to come out and hang out with us improv people. And I joined their improv group and it was probably the best thing I've ever done. Doug is incredibly interesting. So again, he has this very creative mind, but as you'll see in this episode, he's also extremely academic. So we do these deep dives into some of the academic parts of theater, and especially like community theater and improv. He quotes all these random people I had never heard of, but now I get to do this academic deep dive into theater, you know, history and philosophy, which makes my brain tingle. Anyways, Doug is incredibly fascinating. I'm so excited for you to hear his story. So please enjoy Doug Ironside. As long as you have the signature Doug hat on. Yeah, that's right. I can't do it with. Well, I didn't. I didn't shave my head, so it. I kind of look a little rough. Like I'm so due to shave my head, so I figured I'd. I'd wear the signature hat. Uh, I'd go. I'd. I'd. I'd go. I'd go skinny and 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 free flow into the wind if if I had done up my head. But my my shaver. Uh, it's a long. My shaver is the battery's dead, so you can barely do. Yeah, I need to buy a new one. So. Well, and um, it's- it's COVID too, so who cares? It's Honestly. not about what I look like. It's about what I say. Exactly. Dear Lord, I'm gonna come up with the goods to say something interesting. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, tell me your story, Doug. Uh, I kind of have uh, three or four major um, incarnations of theater in my life. I'm not sure which one you wanted to talk about. I kind of have my training where I went to Brock University for theater, which was a very interesting experience. So that's sort of, and I actually have a pre-Brock experience, you know, leading up to why the heck anyone would go to school for theater. And then I have a a sort of 20s, late 20s interesting experience leading into going back to school for nursing. And then I have a blank spot where... um, where I went to school for four years and really didn't do any theater, but then I picked up uh, theater immediately after nursing school. So then I had a really major deep dive into community theater, but there, and then I had a kind of a renaissance in my mid forties when I moved to Aurelia and Stacy and I needed to um, make some friends and meet, make, make some creative connections. So um, I could focus on any of that (laughs) as part of a history Um, or, you know, I could focus on the recent, on the now I, I, I'm open. Like what, what do you think would be more interesting to your listenership? I want to know all of it. (laughs) You want to know all of it? Well, yeah, oh my God! I know. I'm not exactly the most concise person. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll start at the beginning. You can edit out anything that you that you want. Deal. Okay. Okay. So, um, my interest in theater began when I was a teenager. Uh, strangely enough, I, I I didn't. I had a gap in my high school calendar that I couldn't fill. It had a conflict in my schedule, and uh, the only thing I could really fit in there was theater. And I had no interest in theater. I had no experience in that as a child. I said, oh, "I'll take that. It'll be easy." And um, it turned out it kind of was easy, but not because no one was trying or doing anything compelling. It was more that it just sort of came naturally to me and I thought this was kind of a, a way to be expressive. So it turned out I loved it 
and uh, thus created my love affair with my high school drama teacher. And uh, not a not a real love affair, but more of a spiritual affair. Mm-hmm. And um, that was what I ended up going to school for, because when I graduated from high school, I really didn't have any other passions at that time that I could have identified as something I, I want to do as either a career or a, um, a, a an immersive learning opportunity. So I go to Brock University and um, I loved all of the elements. I didn't necessarily love my professors, but I, I did love all the elements that they were trying to teach me. It's a deeply sort of immersive thing. Uh, at Brock U, it was um, a, a kind of a comprehensive thing where you had to learn technical elements, acting elements, um, everything from costuming to makeup. To, like, they, they expose you to everything. And then uh, the part I didn't appreciate was dramatic literature, so I changed my major to avoid <laughs> a double major to history and and theater so I could avoid the drama lit component and study other things besides dramatic literature because I was I was so convinced and I, I still am to this day uh, maybe 30 years later thereabouts that theater uh, a, a, a script is kind of a code it's a, it's it's a it's it's a it's a, it's like a scripture, a Rosetta Stone to like how to create this piece of art, this uh, piece of performing art. Um, it's much less, not to say it has no value as a piece of literature, but it that's not its first best purpose. That's not a, its intention. So um, studying dramatic literature in my 20s was... Uh, Frustrating, to say the least. So uh, I enjoyed, I very much enjoyed the acting component. I, I wanted to do as much acting as possible. Um, but then when I graduated from Brock U, I actually, I, I, I kind of flunked out in my last year. I got all the theater components, but not the history components. That's kind of ironic. Because um, I changed my major to avoid drum lit. So, <laughs> so I, I have all the theater parts, but I'm short one history and half a French. So then I went uh, I went to work and I was serious about uh, this girl at the time who turned out to be my first wife and um, didn't do theater for a few years. And then um, I went through a transformative period in my life where I lost my first wife, which was a blessing, and the job I had done. Uh, all at the same time. So it was a very transformative part of my life. I had to re- reinvent myself. So I went back to school for nursing. And just before I did, um, I was I was deeply involved in a, a community theater slash semi-professional theater called Caridwin Theater in uh, Barrie. And they had built this theater in what was arguably a very not a very good spot. Uh, this, you know, location, location, location. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. And they, they, they couldn't attract an audience in the south end of Barrie. And Barrie's always been a bit of a cultural uh, black hole, a bit of a cultural abyss, especially proportionate to its population. Um, so then Caridwin was suffering and it kind of faltered and flailed and eventually disappeared. Um, it was an interesting experience for a time. All right, then we're getting into the 30s. So I emerged from nursing school. I haven't done theater in four years. I haven't had the time. I'm working and going to school again. And my sister actually puts this audition notice in front of me and uh, says, you you should go do this. Um, so I was back in Midland at the time, and I got involved with Theronia Players and thus began a sort of seven or eight year deeply immersive um uh, commitment to Heronia players and their artistic inv- advancement. Um, that could make for a very compelling story if you want to talk about that. Um, then I moved to Aurelia for love. I, I met my beautiful and talented wife, Stacy. We were both theater people. And um, for a few years, we kind of just had to make the relationship work, but we needed to make friends as well. So together, we created uh, a, an improvisation uh, troupe called um, uh, O-Town Improv at the time, and we just used it as an outlet to meet people. It was open to all skill levels and ages, and um, that transformed eventually, after a number of years, into 
what I would say another semi-professional troupe called uh, All the Keeners kind of wanted to get out there and, and do improvisation, uh, perform for audiences, and we turned that into um, old, the Old Dance Hall Players. Uh, which is a troupe that we continue to run and continues to perform with the exception of COVID, you know, making things very, very difficult. We still do. And then if you sprinkle all of my other experiences there, I've acted and directed in, in roughly, you know, I've, I've, I've directed about five productions and acted in several dozen of them, of course, all of that. Um, um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a theater dog's body. There's the whole picture from my initial entry into where I am now. It sort of represents. So I've, I glossed over thirty something years of <laughs> of all of this theater stuff that I've I've never really let it go. It's kind of in my blood, and uh, I just keep coming back to it in various degrees and in different forms, and uh, continue to do it. I'll probably do it till I die on some <laughs> some level. So there's there's the story as concisely as I can tell 30 years of history. I love it. After your theater school experience, um, did you try to pursue acting professionally? Or what was the I job never that did. you did? Why? Uh, I went into business at that mm. time. Um, it was because I was very serious about the relationship I had with uh, the lady that would, my first wife. Um Without going too deep into my own personal emotions at that time, I really didn't. I, it never occurred to me. It, it's kind of a strange thing. It never occurred to me to pursue it professionally. It, it was something I was doing for interest. Now, that was also. It also had to do with a, a profound change in my family, where uh, my father had had this very, very successful business, and times were very, very good. And when I got, and I didn't really have to concern myself with too many monetary concerns without going any further into that story, which I, I'm not nearly intoxicated enough to tell. <laughs> but um, right when I got into first year and second year university, my father's business kind of collapsed. Um, and then m money went from really, really good, the family having quite a bit of financial well-being, into the family going into a crisis. And then I thought, well, I can't afford to be broke and married uh, and move out of my uh, situation in with my, what, my, my girlfriend, my serious girlfriend, where we're going to get married. I need to have a job that has more stability. So it never really occurred to me to live that type of lifestyle where I was going to be chasing auditions and living in Toronto, perhaps, and, and that my, the woman I ended up marrying, we had plans to have a house and kids and um, more of a small town existence. So while theater was still deeply in my heart and my blood and I had pursued it very intensely for a number of years, it was nothing that I was going to do professionally. I always said... It was only later. It was much, much later in my life. I said, "Damn it, I'm going to get paid for this." Um, <laughs> so, you know, which was, was just sort of a challenge I took on later in life. But uh, you know, when I was in my twenties, I thought, "No, we we got a life to live. Um, I can't live that type of lifestyle." And many people go and chase that type of lifestyle and never succeed. So I just I never gave it a go uh, in my twenties. You know, the twists and turns, the forks in the road, the river bending around. It just wasn't in the cards for me. Yeah. So do I regret it? I probably regretted it in my 30s a little bit. But then I changed gears again. I've always had so many darn interests. And and that has been a blessing uh, in one way because there's so many things I'm interested in. Um, you name it, I've probably taken a deep dive in it at one point in my life. Um but the theater is a recurrent theme in my life, but it's not, and it's deep, deep down in my soul. It's sort of pulsing on my heart. Um, I'll never forget it. I never let it go completely. But I've had, you know, burgeoning interests in other things where I obsess with, uh, uh, I have other interests like canoeing, outdoor exploration, uh, writing, other creative outlets, uh, public speaking, facilitation. Um, I, I'm, pa I'm passionate about my job. So, you know, um, I'm trying to live this mosaic, this tapestry of a life. So um, that's basically what happened. Yeah. And so what brought you into what is now your current, you know, grown up job? 
nursing. What brought you into nursing school and now your job in nursing? Uh, well, when you go to school in your 20s for an experiential thing, experiential uh, exploration of your soul and your, your mind, um, it, it, that, that was one thing. And it was the worst financial decision of my life. Um, you know, I probably spent $33,000. I think that was, was my debt. You know, so I spent more than that, but I walked away 33 large in the hole and uh, didn't have anything to show for it. You know, I always say with that, uh, with that education and, and, and two bucks, I could buy a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, so then after, you know, I worked for four years and did fairly well in business. I wasn't, I wasn't great at it, but I wasn't terrible either. Um, you know, I worked my way up to a decent uh, position inside uh, a, 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 a tool. A, they dealt with tools, and uh, I was kind of a salesman and, and, and store manager at the same time. And when that, when the marriage and that job sort of lost at the same time, I was completely free. So I could have chosen just about anything. So I, I went into nursing and medicine because I, di I didn't want to work in a corporate atmosphere anymore. I was sort of, that wasn't, um, I got into a job competition where I was the last of two candidates after a very large uh, search and I almost got the job. I was candidate B out of A and P at the very, very end. And that put me to a bit of a decision where I said, you know, hey, the, uh, this isn't me. I got to reinvent myself. So, you know, I chose nursing partly because my mother was a nurse for 33 years and was always the stable one in the relationship. And I kind of wanted stability and employability at the end. I wanted to help people, not sort of sell things to people. I wanted to change the, the motif of um, what I was going to do. Uh, at the time, there was a shortage of nurses. So I knew there was good employability. So if I invested in this education, I was going to get a, a gainful career. And I was going to just have faith that I was going to find a niche. So that was uh, an interesting experience from when I was 30 to about 34. And then I got right back into theater as soon as I, uh, that, thanks to my sister. Thank you, Lori. And um, yeah, so after the nursing career uh, was established, I got, I got my hands dirty again. Um, that was one thing I did want to talk about, mm -hmm. which was, I, I think many of your listeners will, will maybe they'll be professional actors or a mix of semi-professional actors or, or community theater actors. You know, I've kind of done all, I've dabbled in all of that, but uh, community theater provides your uh, most reliable, most consistent theater experience for most people. Um who are doing theater. I think they are the greatest body of, of, of theater creative types who uh, want to do that everywhere from someone on the verge of maybe getting a movie role, doing extra work, all the way down to somebody who's taking improvisation classes, acting classes, all the way down to the, the person that's involved in one show every three years on the community theater level. I think that community theater spectrum is very interesting because that's your broadest collection of people mm -hmm. of all skills and ages. I think that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Community theater, to me, who has just now started into community theater, having never done it before, I did some theater when I was a kid that was actually like a professional touring company that I was part of. But community theater is just, it's the best. It's the best. Like there's, there's nothing else like it, I don't think, right? It's a group of human beings who solely have one beautiful goal in mind and just want to, <laughs> this sounds so corny, they just want to make the world a better, more creative place. And then your audience, I find, is there's nothing like a community theater audience, right? I think they're just so supportive. I've had, um, I, I think community theater, um, because I've been involved so deeply, I, um, I, I have... Um, I've really been able to look at it from both sides or from v the various facets that encompass it. So on one hand, yes, you are right. A at its best level, it is a group of people of like mind and similar passion, sharing, dare I say, love, affection, um, emotion, and a want to generate meaningful art that feels satisfying 
to them and their audiences. So mm-hmm. that's the that's the pinnacle. I'm sure this exact same construct exists in professional theater. Well, because it, community theater is kind of a mirror of professional theater with just much less money. Uh, community theater has much less money. Professional theater has more money. They still starve. <laughs> don't don't get yourself Shaw and 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 Stratford. You know they're begging for money and government grants every year to keep the boat afloat. So you know that's a different story. Anyway, so community theater at its heart has much less money, but it has tremendous passion. Similar idea, passion. And where people's passions are, and their hobbies and their interests are, that's where their soul is. So they're very emotionally invested. And that emotional investiture, I wouldn't say has a dark side, but it has another side to the sword. Two sides. Mm-hmm. Have you experienced that? or? Uh, not yet. But as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, I think I kind of see what you're getting at. But yes, please do elaborate. Please <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> well, this is... Okay, so for one thing, just... I don't want to spew off about community theater before I say this, okay? Because community theater is a lovely thing, and it, 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 but its nuances might be interesting to those of any of you listening. That it might be interesting in terms of its political construct. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But first, let me just espouse my 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 love of theater. Okay, so theater itself. I'm not I'm not critical of the art form at all. In fact, I think the art form is absolutely one of the most wondrous and and beautiful things that I have ever experienced in my whole life. It is an ancient form of storytelling that transcends transcends civilization, let alone culture. It is reflected in the basis storytelling and the most fundamental transfer of ideas and emotions and ideologies throughout all culture and all of history. And it literally transcends the basis of civilization like before we wrote anything down we were still telling stories in this way we were still dancing around the fire we were still recounting ghost stories that's all very theatrical elements it's a very beautiful wondrous part of the human condition all right so then if that's your ideology and you love it and you believe in it it's almost like a mini religion in your heart yeah what there what the difference is is that um, once you organize it into a group, it has the potential for absolute magic. You know, like if you've ever been on a team sport, you know that that team can do magic things together. But that team can also disintegrate <laughs> and tear each other apart. Yes. So, you know, you want... And, and 70% of the time, it's magic. So it's only 30% of the time it really sucks. And, and things are, are, are bad. But I've had all of those experiences together. Um, so maybe this is an interesting story. Um, so I joined Heronia Players back when I, was in, uh, when I was 35 years old. And it, t- it typified something that I... I discovered something because I got deeper into that community theater than I had ever been. I had had peripheral exposure to a number of community theaters, and I ended up making this beautiful family there. At the same time, um, in the initial goal, something had happened there over the course of the 90s and the early 2000s that kind of typically happens in a lot of community theaters that ebbs and flows, which is there was a, a very serious entrenchment so what had happened was a series, a, you know, a, a community theater at its best and worst is is as good as the people at the very nucleus, the very center. And if that nucleus doesn't change and grow and morph over time, it grows insular and holds all the creative opportunities. And on one hand, you got to give it to those people for hanging in there when things may have not have been so great, and they're like holding the fort, keeping the boat, you know, you know over the waves. On the other hand, they believe that they, they, you know, it becomes stale and stagnant because they've been doing the same thing for a long time. So when we got into your own players and me and some new people tried to integrate some new ideas into what was, had been a sort of, um, a certain amount of cobwebs on the, on the, on the, on the set pieces, if you were to say, you know, a certain amount of, 
dust that needed to be disturbed. It was kind of like going to war uh, to, to make things move and overcome that inertia. Very, very stressful time. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's, there's more to that story, but I'm, I'm blathering on. Um, I could tell some very dramatic stuff about that. But but anyway. I, can see, I can see what you mean, right? Well, it, it happens everywhere when you put human beings together in a group from the dawn of civilization, since you're talking about storytelling back around the campfire. It always sure. is going to happen. And people don't like change because change is terrifying and they want to stay in a nice, nice, safe spot. But as somebody now who is you know, part of the nucleus of something, right? Like old dance hall players, for example. Mm. How do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Because you have, in my experience, been incredibly welcoming to new people and new ideas. Present company included. (laughs) (laughs) I am welcoming. I want new people and new blood. I don't want to be entrenched. Um, well, and so do you pull that from your your prior career? Do you pull that from your nursing? Like where do you where does that where does that come from? How do you prevent that? Yeah, I you know I think that happens in 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 from from professional in professional theater groups where you have this, you know, a closed little circle of people managing everything and a, and a budget and they have tricks and tips and that work and they know how to write grants and they they've got actors who are commercially successful and audiences that they're going to you know what's really interesting it's kind of a very brechtian idea it's kind of ironic you know the entrenchment factor that does happen um because brecht would would have you uh bertold brecht his philosophy was that theater should sort of reflect society, make people think, uh, examine the very structures within which they live and breathe and play and work. Um, so it's kind of ironic, you know, that uh, the very storytelling method that should help you advance your learning and thinking and growing spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, as a community. Um, if you don't sort of ebb and flow and change and, 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 and get new blood involved and new ideas and new thinking, um, it, it, like any group in any type of thing, it could be a lawn bowling group, it could be a dart club. If the same people are in charge and doing things the same way for too long, it loses its freshness and its ability to evolve. Yeah. Definitely. So, so coming all the way back around, I know that the group that I work with now, that I'm at the center of, myself and my wife and a few others, we know that we need change and new blood and, and growth and we need to expand our horizons and keep moving forward. That is a very hard lesson that I've learned over time. <laughs> Very hard lesson. Because, you know, once I got in and I became on the executive of a community theater group, what did I want to do? I wanted to hog a lot of really cool creative opportunities for myself. But, you know, I want to do all the things I've been wanting to do for years. Absolutely. Um, You know, um, I was big into contemporary uh, theater. I wanted to do... I was so tired of old chestnuts and, and things that had been done a hundred times because they were commercially um, successful. They were going to be successful because, you know, they knew, like, no sex leads were British, move over Mrs. Marple, Blythe spirit. Um, you know, any British sex farce, you know, you're just, you're catering to the kind of lowest common denominator to reliably put bums in seats. I'm like, okay, let's and then I was involved with Black Horse Village players for a little while. And um, so this was, uh, what the, what's the vintage of Black Horse in that time? So it was about the early 2000s. And what I had discovered with them is they had sort of cultivated a more progressive and accepting audience to, that in turn allowed them to choose more adv- adventurous uh, material and more contemporary material because the audience was sort of conditioned to sort of realize that we can come see a show that we haven't seen before as long as it's done really well. Mm. 
there's it, good theater is good theater mm -hmm. and if it's a good show and it's entertaining for whatever it is be it a serious drama or something that has something you know edgy to say about society we'll just come and see it if it's going to be well done so to encourage people to to make more progressive choices more modern choices do something a bit more daring and try and build that audience you know and that's a really interesting question you know how does any group and any creative group um define success how is success defined is it bums and seats is it money in the bank is it an ability to compensate our actors reasonably well is it that we have a very satisfied audience is that we made compelling art what is it that's a good question you and i met through improv and your we did. improv group talk to me more about improv and your okay. experience with it and like if you have any thoughts, philosophies, anything like that, because most people I've talked to so far, and me included, people who've had other careers and are now testing the waters of acting, we come from very logical brains because we've gone through the logical steps of becoming career people. Doctor, lawyer, teacher. And then now we're trying to do acting, which is trying to throw the logical brain away. And the best, adv <laughs> best advice I ever got was, Janet, you need to go do some goddamn improv because you need to relax. And then improv is the most terrifying thing I've ever done because of that. Okay. I have um, no question. That's just a statement. <laughs> okay. Well, well, well okay. Uh, you know, I've kind of espoused my political philosophy here. <laughs> All right. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Janet came out and, and joined the old dance hall players. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, a COVID hiatus, and then that had changed the arc of a number of people inside the group. One person retired and moved away. One person had to work from home religiously. One person went back to school to be a teacher. Um, and we needed um, an infusion of new female talent. And somebody told me Janet's name. <laughs> oh, my God. Why, why did I listen to that person? No, anyway, so Janet and a couple of others came out. And, <laughs> yes, you did. You came out. And... Uh, I could see a little fear in your eyes, oh uh, but God. it was beautiful. It was beautiful to see you learn in real time. Um, you learn in real time on stage. Uh, I, I shit you not. I'm not kidding. You learn in real time as fast as anybody I, I've ever seen. So you oh. do have a good improvisational mind because you're picking up what people are putting down real quick. <laughs> Um, okay, so improvisation, so that's good. I like to talk about what's new rather than yeah. just history. All right, so what's happening now? So uh, just prior to COVID, the old dance hall players were doing very, very well. We were picking up gigs, uh, doing... Um, so we were bridging from semi-professional into like genuinely professional. It was good. Um, we were picking up gigs left and right. We were performing at Fern Resort all summer long, which we are again this year. Um, we were uh, picking up holiday gigs, private gigs, private parties. We were doing public shows and things were going swimmingly until COVID hit in that, that crimped theater entirely. Um, here we are coming back again. Um, so for those of you who may not know what the old dance hall players do, we perform short form improvisation comedy, much like the TV show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? If you've ever seen that show or you see it on YouTube, um, sort of short form games that are facilitated by a moderator who either is or isn't participating in the group. And we, we do that stuff and it is funny and ridiculous and stretches one's mind to oh. m make things up right on the spot. So, Janet, to come back to you. So, many people are very script-reliant. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of actors out there. If you don't, if you don't have those tools, that, those bones and that, 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 those signposts to get them to that character, they're kind of 
deeply afraid. Mm-hmm. That that isn't everybody, um, but it, it, there is a type of of soul out there who is great with a script in their hand or a script in their soul, but not not so good when they don't feel they're they're loose and fancy free and there's no there's no rules there's no there's no foundation to adhere to would you not would you not agree 100 percent, of course and the logical brain person that i am likes the script right because it's there's check boxes to check off it's a to-do list and it's a framework the the words have been decided for yeah i don't want to say it's easy because it's not easy but it's just it's predictable I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your tr- the goal has been set. Yeah. yeah. Right? Be- between the script itself and the, what the director is telling you, the goal has been set. Yeah. And we, we know where we're going within a certain, within certain parameters. We may discover something on the unexpected on the rehearsal floor and we may cut it in and it might be beautiful. In fact, I hope that happens to every director and actor out there. You know, create inside your rehearsals, kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I've always said, I, I learned this in theater school, but I didn't know it in theater school. Um, acting is this this adventure in memory and imagination. Those are really your only two tools. You either remember what it is that you did in life, like you you know how to drink a cup of tea because you've drank a thousand cups of tea and you it's hot and it's steamy and that's how it's behaving which is a very Stanislavski sort of method acting thing or imagination you know you've never drank a cup of tea that's ridiculous but let's imagine you never did so you kind of have to imagine or recall what other people have done and and you kind of do that and and you make it believable to others you know whether you're making it up uh something you've seen or something you did so improvisation is kind of that but magnified by magnified so not only is it about remembering things but your imagination is given a lot more wiggle room in fact it improvisation needs that imagination it needs the creativity of a five-year-old to play you know let's say let's say i'm the princess of 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 a voldemort castle and and you're the knight with the and then we establish reality it takes 10 seconds and then yeah. we literally have to work within that established uh, reality so how did you find establishing that reality and working with that in real time how did you dis- how did you react to that when when we invited you in what was yeah. your initial thought oh uh, pure terror of course um and i think i chatted with stacy a bit about this you know i definitely relied on the crutch of like i'm a new beginner i'm just learning this <laughs> right oh, 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 oh. until you can't and you realize oh i'm no longer a new beginner i'm like on stage getting paid to do improv i'm not a beginner anymore um the biggest thing for me i remember coming back from the very first workshop that we did and saying to my husband wow i'm an incredibly selfish person why did you why did you say that it was because of the active listening where you know you kind of improv is as you know you should go in with what you want the scene to be and then that doesn't happen because you're relying on somebody else so you have to just be like don't go into a scene wanting it to be something Mm-hmm. And so there were times I'd be like, oh, hey, 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 there's the prompt. I know exactly what's going to be funny now. And then you just don't even listen to the person that you're with. And there were times I remember that first workshop being like, everything I did was not correct because I just wasn't listening to the other person in my scene. And it's like, I, I yeah, they were talking, but I really didn't take in what they were saying. And I think that's an, I think that's an art. So I think it's a learned skill. It is absolutely a learned skill. Yeah. Um, because even though improvisation has minimal rules, yeah. it does have certain rules. Um, I, th- I, believe that, <laughs> I believe if you follow the Del Close. So Del Close was this famous uh, improvisational pioneer. Uh, and he... Uh, worked with a number of very famous people 
as improvisation became legitimized as something you just didn't do as a rehearsal exercise, but that you actually could do for others. Mm-hmm. And and Del Close uh, was one of those, you know, big leading the charge. He's kind of like Magellan or Francis Drake, you know, <laughs> sailing the ship around the improv world. Um, so I think I believe there are like roughly six rules. Um, so kind of staying in the moment is one of them right mm-hmm. which involves listening um yes and which is agreement is the mm-hmm. rule you must agree if i say there's this table here and i'm behaving as if like there's soft drinks on the table you must also agree <laughs> that there are soft drinks on the table you're like what is all this nonsense like there's no table here well then you're you're destroying the fundamental reality that we're trying to establish so yeah and then even in those six rules, uh, all of them can be broken under certain circumstances, except agreement. Agreement is the fundamental rule that cannot be broken. Um, because if I establish this table and soft drinks and we're here for the Pepsi challenge, if you discount that, we got nothing. We got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you got to listen to me. But at the same time, here I made the initial establishment. We're here for the Pepsi challenge. Ooh, that's where we're at. I've got to listen to the words that come out of your mouth because whatever you say in response to me is real. Mm-hmm. I, I've got a deal. Like, what would a reasonable person do in that situation? Or maybe what would a not completely unreasonable person do in that situation? That might be funny, too. Um, and improv isn't always about comedy, but it's about an established reality, and it plays very much with the audience's sense of anticipation, which many traditional plays do. Yeah. Stories mess with your sense of anticipation. They give you something. They present something that you know will happen later they put a door there and you better think someone's going to come through what's going to happen but improvisation does that constantly where you're there's going to be the shoe that's going to drop there's just going to be this thing it's this is a jar of poison and it just sits there on stage i just made that up there's this jar of poison is that person going to drink it and then the audience is like, oh, my God, yes, somebody's going to drink the poison, but who, but when, but how? <laughs> or do they, you know, all of this nonsense just totally um, engages the audience, whether it's funny or not, this yeah. sense of anticipation, this beautiful, it's going to happen, maybe, if you hang yeah. in there. And it requires audience buy-in in that mm. in that way. So... You could see all the preparation I put into this interview. I, I'm just like a true improviser. I'm just making it all up as I go along. Um, I didn't know what the hell we were going to talk about, but improv's oh. cool. Improv is so cool. And it it's funny because after the first workshop and after the subsequent ones and our performance and stuff like that, I had more than anything, I think this is going to overly dramatic more than anything in my life Doug um I had um (laughs) acting you're making me laugh laugh. (laughs) I I had this huge weight was just lifted off my shoulders and it was so free freeing because of having lived my my life in science is very algorithmic because it has to be right you know in nursing it's algorithms that we follow otherwise people die and bad things happen where improv is just not and so that feeling of oh like my my brain was just craving that you know just free creative uh, intim not intimidating because nothing about the, your, this group is intimidating but just that that fear and excitement that adrenaline rush and so much so that i was just like craving it afterwards craving it i'm excited this week like i don't know if stacy told you i signed up for an improv class at second city because i was like I need, oh, to learn very good. Mo- I need to learn more about this this is so fun i want to do more of this because of the yeah the adrenaline and the well, and the people of course too like i the utmost support like when we were on stage at the opera house of these these you know veterans being so supportive of us newbies i just remember looking over and like kk's face looking at me being like yes girl i'm like thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> just, just yes. support emanating from people i'm on a big rant but just it no, was great. <laughs> I've been ranting this whole interview so far. So, yeah, it was great to see you 
uh, learn and grow. Uh, I remember when we played the game Elimination, which is basically the same scene played a number of times with a fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer actors each time where until one actor is doing all the parts uh-huh. and 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 you were the last person and you were doing all the parts and that was so delicious to watch because <laughs> i believe that was your first public performance of improvisation yes and that person who's left at the end of elimination um really is on the hot seat to remember an entire scene with five actors and I kinda, can still and remember you gotta, it. <laughs> you gotta boil that scene down yeah. to its most fundamental essence. Now mm-hmm. like anything, there are tricks. Making elimination work, you gotta remember the first line and the last line and something key in between. If you can do that, you can play elimination. But and you did I, I thought you you were very game. Oh, I was it yeah. was beautiful to see you go. Do you have any crazy or funny stories from your time? Doesn't need to be improv. Okay. On stage or anything like that. I probably have the most notorious i have several of course i do <laughs> okay. but i have probably the most famous notorious story uh in all, in all of theater i almost i almost killed somebody inadvertently um okay do you want do you want this you want this tale okay i'll edit it if it's horrible <laughs> it's not it's not horrible everybody everybody lived um <laughs> So, this is, this is a high school story, but it's it's about anyway. I was we were doing a play uh, called Dracula. There are many theatrical versions of Dracula. Um, the traditional director at our high school was a guy named Ray Ray Holt. He he passed on. He's gone now. Um, I was him and I very much had an understanding and mutual respect. Uh, it does, it's not going to sound like it in this story. Um, he didn't direct Dracula. He agreed to do the special effects. And uh, this included uh, a flash pot, uh, you know, a little poof, some clouds, Dracula appears, wiring all these sounds like buzzers, zzz, ring, ring, all this stuff. And um, it was cool. You know, he's putting it all in. And everybody's fooling around with it, ring, ring, buzz, buzz. You know, they're playing around with all the sound effects and doing what teenagers do. And I said, you know, I got it one cue here. I better go see what these, you know, what these sounds are all about. I wanted to make the buzzer buzz. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. So I go back behind the stage and there is a sea of buttons. There's got to be all these buttons on all these control modules. Um three on one five on another they're all unmarked there's wires coming out of everything i like think of myself hmm which one of these turns on the buzzer (laughs) so i i press button number one nothing nothing's happening what about button number two nothing Button number three, kaboom! There's this huge explosion. Like a cannon went off. And I look to my right, and the entire stage is billowing with white smoke. Like, like you can't even see. Like, the whole place is just billowing with this massive cloud of white smoke, impenetrable. Oh and I, I run down off the stage and into the auditorium and coming out of this you know fog is ray holt who was a huge man he was like six foot three three hundred pounds and he's kind of staggering he's doing one of these you know coming out of there and he's got little bits of blood on his huge belly and it turned out that he was he was pre- he was filling the flash pot at the exact same time oh that I pressed button number three. And after years of doing this, Ray had 
you know, had a certain familiarity breeds contempt. He had neglected to put the safety on or didn't tell anybody, don't touch that don't while I'm filling the flag. Yeah. Exactly. Of, of about 50 buttons, you know, <laughs> like of all the things. Um, so um, Ray emerges from this fog and Vice Principal Woods was there that day. who was like the heavy at our school. You know, he was like the dick. You know the 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 disciplinarian. I don't even know what he was doing there. Like, what's this guy doing there that day? He runs towards the front because of the explosion. He wants to make sure that everybody's okay, and he looks at everybody and he says, "What happened?" You know, and he's talking. And everybody's like, "I don't know. I don't know." He goes to me. He goes, "What happened?" And at that moment, I looked at him and I thought. If I say the truth, we will never have a special effect at MSS ever again. So just the entire history of, or future history of of theater flashes before my eyes and I have the wisdom. He says, what happened? And I said, I have no idea. (laughs) So Ray is like burnt up his arm. He's got a little bit of glass in his belly. He's, he's taken like this explosion, this hand grenade at three feet, you know? So he's like, I gotta go. So Ray's making a beeline for the door. He's just cutting through the auditorium. So I run to the outside auditorium in the parallel hall and I race down the hall and I meet Ray. He's walking out the door and I come tearing around the side and I meet him there and I go, Ray, 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 it was me. And Ray says, I know. And he walks out. Uh, That's amazing. And and that guy, he, because because Vice Principal Woods was there, he came back to rehearsal half an hour later to illustrate to all of us and to Vice Principal Woods that this was nothing. Yeah, this was par for the course. Yeah. Nothing to worry about. So I, so and then years later, Ray would you know have other high school drama uh, classes, and he would say, I he would tell the story with great relish to other people, and he would say. Doug Ironside. That's the guy that nearly blew me up. <laughs> oh my god. So that that is uh, yeah, that is probably the fa- most famous. Yeah. Um, That's incredible. Yeah, years years later, we had a party. We had like an anniversary party and we put some famous slogans like referring to some very infamous and famous events that had happened in in uh inside the Heronia players and midland theater scene and so we put these slogans on the back of the t-shirt and on on the back of mine it said ray holt goes kaboom (laughs) and uh he was there he got a kick out of that he got a kick out of that. So that that's pretty infamous. I don't think I it gets it. Nope. gets much crazier than that. Yeah. So do you have any advice for anybody interested in say trying improv or trying theater kind of later on in life? Um do you have any advice? Um I haven't really thought about that. I um I would say you know, if you want to give something a try, you should. We we only get so many kicks at the can in life. As I've gotten a bit older, you know, you got to try things. Um, when we have given, like, uh, Kristen Keller, who's one of our improvisation dogs' bodies, she, like me, uh, when Stacy and I first got here, uh, we did a bunch of courses for all skill levels. Um, and we... Um, And Kristen also did the same thing. And I think it's just about openness and and willingness to explore. Um, You know, Shaw said, 
we we don't cease to play because we get old. We get old because we cease to play. I think there's some tremendous wisdom in that. I think you've got to be willing to play. If you're going to try something more traditional and you want that script, I think that same essence uh, comes into play. When I'm directing a production, I'm directing a production coming up this summer for Mariposa Arts Theatre. I'm directing um, the complete works of William Shakespeare. Uh, it's going to go on in, in June. Um, it has certain improvisational elements to it. And what you want as a director, even inside the traditional sphere, like obviously in the improv setting, you want people to play and go as wacky and as crazy as they'll go. You, you can always pull it back 10% and say, okay, maybe that was a bit much or this choice was a bit you know too risque. Mm-hmm. But even inside contemporary film, contemporary theater, on any level, from the most basic, you know, church production, base church basement production, all the way up to the most high-level professional theater in Toronto, to say, or Chicago. I think what theater deserves is that sense of play and imagination and creativity. Um, what you see new people do is restrict themselves and hold them, them themselves down. Where I think, you know, they're trying theater because they consider themselves an expressive, creative person. So you want people to go a bit too far. What is is a director or group of actors except sculptors who are trying to sort of carve away the the pieces? I, I think if you think of it as a sculpture, you want all the energy and all the magnetism and all the energy, and you want to carve away the pieces to come down to the thing whether it's a comedy, drama, thriller, whatever it is. If you don't have enough clay, <laughs> you can't come down. you yeah. you got to start slapping clay on. Okay. So I would suggest my piece of advice after all of those metaphors is don't be afraid to play. You've got to go, as, go farther than you think, it, you know, 10% beyond normal. Um, you can always come back to natural. You can always come back. But what's more difficult is for people to go further. Go further. Go crazy. What do you have to lose? Just let it all hang out. You know, I say, one of the acting exercises they teach you at theater school is like, how big can you be on stage? That's very early on. And uh, often beginning actors are confused by that. So then the theater instructor sort of does a big spread eagle X and she goes, this big. That's how big you can be. That's it. That's your physical limitation. Like, in terms of energy, I don't know how you can go so far as you look like you're screaming and yelling, but, you know, that's far. Now, to get an actor to sort of spread eagle their legs and their arms and yell on stage, especially somebody new, you think they're terrified of just being there. And you said, I just, I just want you to... And they would get you to do this exercise where you would you would spread your arms, you would put your head to the ceiling, and you would say... I'm ready! Which feels particularly stupid. You know, it doesn't feel like, what, what is this? What am I, what are they trying to do? You know, and they can't articulate it. Maybe no one articulated it to them. But what I'm ready, that exercise does, is get you ready to be big. Get you ready to be creative. It wants, get your juice, you know? So that's my advice. Go get that juice. Be brave. You got nothing to lose. Thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you Doug for being my guest. I hope you all enjoyed this wonderful two episode week of second act actors with people who were first act actors and are now able to lovingly create beautiful creative lives after having doing immense amounts of change throughout their life. I love it. Uh, This is a shameless plug because Doug and I, like I said, are in the same improv group. If you ever want to come and see us try and do improv, make a huge fool out of ourselves, especially me, Doug's great at it. I'm just more embarrassing than anything. Uh, Check out the old dance hall players. That's our improv group. We have public shows every so often, and it'd be great to have you come out and introduce yourself. I love to meet people who listen to the show. Uh, That would just be fantastic. Uh, I hope you'll tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. And 
if you can, like and subscribe and tell your friends because that's what gets this podcast out there. And you know, I love stories and I love people telling me stories about how they found this podcast. So again, I hope you'll tune in next week for another episode. Bye!